difference. It will also give confidence to people who are investing, people who are willing to make, engage in businesses that India is a better place to do business. So, okay. Reform securities laws. There, there's still huge amount of laws about, you know, especially when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. Okay. So there, there still are laws that prevent M&A activity in India, and that is crucial. An investor who sees, they, they see how I want to exit also. It also influences your private equity market, your venture capital market. All of those are influenced because you don't have a well-functioning mergers and acquisitions market. You don't have security laws that can be enforced. You don't have laws that are welcoming to foreign investors. Here, there are many in this audience also might be sitting. This may or may not be the kind of audience that buys securities. But if you wish to, not too many questions would be asked. Are you a foreigner? Are you a domestic? This, that, not many questions would be asked. Whereas in India, you would be paralyzed <clears throat> answering all those questions, and especially if you're an institutional investor. And so there is a long way to go, and this can be done easily. Building better institutions is crucial for economic development. Okay. Uh, regulation on a diet, and this is, you know, whether it is domestic and international trade, foreign currency convertibility, foreign investment through mutual funds, foreign ownership of property. I came here in 1986. I graduated from, uh, I got my PhD and went to Rochester. I bought a home. I was still a foreigner. I, I, I hadn't even had green card in my hand, and still nobody asked, gee, you know, how can you buy property? So as a foreigner, I didn't have to file some enormous amount of paperwork or keep reporting anything. So that's the sense in which you have to, if you want to attract capital, you have to make it somewhat easier both to buy and to sell. That is critical. So, so that's the sense in which travel visas, they are making it a little bit easier, but that has been the pet peeve for a long time of how onerous it is to enter or exit India. And, and that's the sense in which there are some, some issues. Foreign currency convertibility, people always say that, gee, you know, if you make rupee convertible, everybody will convert their money into dollars, and then you know, there would be huge pressure on that. And they're thinking in a static world. Because think about it. If you say that it is convertible, then the government or politicians you know, will have to start thinking into, well, what should I do to make holding of a rupee attractive? Of course, people will hold the money. If you put a fence around you, then you say that, gee, you know, the person is staying inside the fence. Well, of course, there's no choice. But the real trick is to provide the freedom and still make the person want to stay within that premises. That's where you are adding some value. And that's the way to think about foreign currency convertibility. That what should I do to make it attractive? What has US done that to make it attractive for people to hold dollar? US doesn't prevent people from converting it into some other currency. So that's the sense in which can we give them freedom and still people voluntarily hold rupee. And the only litmus test to use is, do they hold or not? If they don't, that means you haven't done enough. You have to tweak, you have to transform, you have to innovate until people do hold voluntarily. And that would be the good exercise for the people, for the government to go through. I'm almost done. Independence of monetary policy, I'm, you know, this has been a little bit recently in debate, that you want to provide the Reserve Bank of India or the central bank with the objectives that you have, but then the tools that they use how to achieve that objective, I think you have to give them the freedom, and that's what the uh, freedom of uh, monetary policy is. And then reality is the action is more on the fiscal side on the more on the institutional people care. We never say that, whoa, oh, gee, you know, Sweden is such a nice and developed, prosperous country, or New Zealand is good, or some other country like that because of the monetary policy. No. We think that 
there is education, there is people have uh, respect for law, there is some civic sense there is in people, and, and openness, there is law enforcement, number of factors come to mind before we think about monetary policy. So, that said, it is important to give. Non-independent monetary policy can do a lot of harm, or bad monetary policy can do a lot of harm. And if you want to avoid that harm, then having good people like Raghuram Rajan and having the independence, I think those are good things. Uh, grandfather the past and look to the future. Every new administration comes and there is, we are going to some truth commission or some other you know, past misdeeds, how we are going to correct those. That effort is with great energy that effort is pursued. Okay. Bad idea. Okay. If you think about who is the lady from Tamil Nadu, right? You know, so Jayalalitha. She is still, if you look at the mansion that she is living in, 20 years they have been going after her. So you are, if you fix law enforcement, you won't have that kind of problem to come about in the first place. So going after those. Now this government also with great fanfare said all the black money from abroad is going to come in. Not a rupee has come in. Not a rupee has come in, okay? So the point is to recognize that that's not where the action is. First of all, all these kinds of attempts are perceived to be partisan, witch hunt and partisan, okay? But more importantly, they take your focus away from what's important to focus on something trivial as that. India is not going to reach even if you bring all the black money into India or all the past people who have been corrupt to recover money from them, Jayalalitha or whosoever. India will be become better if you have, if you reform institutions, if you make it much more welcoming place, if you make education more effective, so on and so forth. So those are the things and they are to focus on those and therefore grandfather the past and look to the future. So anyway, so those are, those are the policies and, and, and I tried to summarize these in terms of some uh, set of uh, policies. I always get a uh, big uh, question mark to looking at forgiveness. That is the part that, that and, and I'm a big believer of that. And if you, if you look at even the, uh, compare, Indian politics with the U.S. Uh, here, someone a dissenting voice immediately. The president of the party doesn't say you are expelled. Okay, it's it's dissenting voice. Let us hear what the voice is, whatever it is. Sometimes ignore it, sometimes not. But over there, it is always okay. I'm going to form another party, or you are expelled. You know that kind of well, well, what kind of democracy there is, and and really what is missing is democracy within the party. That's a crucial piece. That is an extraordinarily important piece that is missing and, and that needs to be fixed urgently. Parachuting Kiran Bedi in Delhi was not a good idea. She had not elected herself to be the chief ministerial candidate from BJP. Now, that's, there are many other things happened and I'm not trying to blame it on just the parachuting, but if, if you were to think about it, that approach is not such a hard idea. With that, let me open it for questions. So, Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> here. Uh, I just wanted to add a couple of words. Uh, so the uh, uh, India 2.0, this, this whole uh, uh, mission will be supported by a, a forum, uh, the, uh, sorry, will, will be governed by a, a committee. The forum will be governed by committee. SP and I are the co-chairs and the other faculty involved are Tuli Banerjee, uh, Ananta Chandrakarsan, um, Mala Ghosh, Simon Johnson, uh, and Bish Sanyal. And uh, I also especially wanted to thank Mala and Misty for arranging this and kicking this off. So thank you very much, Mala. Um, <laughs> Uh, before we go for questions, I just want to tell you that you're going to see me, see me slip away uh, at 6.30. That's because I have to catch a flight at 8. And then Mala is going to continue the Q&A. So with that, questions? Parul, you had a, yeah. So, 
These are all really, really good points. Um, I I noticed that a lot of them are about um, focus. All of them focus very strongly on economic development, economic development, and I'm all about economic development. But one obvious question that comes um, is, yeah, we're talking about increasing the pie, but then the other question is how are we splitting that pie amongst the population, yeah. right? And yeah. is everyone getting their fair share of the growth? And that that yeah. starts getting yeah. the questions of social development and stuff like that. And the classic argument is that of this trickle-down effect that when everyone makes money, you know, everyone gets wealthier. But classically, that's not been the case, not in the US, not in India, um, even when growth has happened. I noticed that none of the, you know, principles were really talking or addressing issues around inclusive growth or inclusive capitalism or social equity of any sort. So what are your thoughts on that? And what are some tactical things that the government can do to promote that? Great point. OK, excellent. And, and I'm a big. I'm, I'm one of those that peaceful coexistence of uh, extraordinarily f free market at the same time thinking about the safety net. If you think about the first point, it's all about that. It is, you know, if, if, you, if you look at here, meritocracy and the second point is compassion and empathy for underprivileged. And if you look at the first point that was about providing financial assistance to the economically underprivileged to promote what? Education and small family. Both of those, I think, are going to empower. This is really teaching them how to fish and making it inclusive growth. Okay. So no country in the world has been prosperous with the kind of demographics that India has barring some oil countries, and they, they, they haven't socially progressed, they have economically some amount. Okay? So the point is we want to get literacy to go from 60% or low 60% that is there to 90% or so by providing financial assistance to those who are economically disadvantaged right now so that they will with the incentive, with the financial supplement, take more active interest in education. They will go and demand that the teachers come to school as opposed to right now, there's no enforcement of that. There's no demand that is coming from the parents also nearly as much, and the teachers are being absent from schools. So that's the sense in which that's extraordinarily important because otherwise, it would be, call it jealousy, call it anything, that the inequality has the potential to influence. We are not going to get rid of inequality. I mean, you know, but that said, we can, we should provide opportunities for the less privileged so that they have an opportunity to climb the ladder of success. So that's 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 what that is, you know, it's sure. important. As for great mm -hmm. uh, presentation, so I may get this wrong, but tell me if I'm wrong. So a lot of your proposals have the flavor of removing constraints. Yes. So the, the I guess the underlying model is that the entrepreneurs are ready to work, the workers are ready to work, uh, university graduate students are ready to jump into entrepreneurship. If you remove the constraint. I don't know if that's enough to get you to 13, 14 percent of the growth, right. right? Without addressing, you know, some of the issues on the on the supply side, the lack of infrastructure, for example, and the <coughs> underdevelopment of. I mean, and the biggest contrast between China and India is the manufacturing. Yes, right? so yes. Extremely difficult to scale manufacturing. Um, right. I, I'm not sure removing all these things would kind of address those issues. Um, Good point. In, in a timely manner, I don't no, know no. if it would. Be <clears throat> so, so, in the interest of keeping this a little bit short, I didn't include the infrastructure, but that's a, an important, critical piece. And I have, okay. So, the privatization of the public sector, okay, is part of it, in the sense that what the government should do is exactly invest in infrastructure. And right now, oftentimes, the government says, well, let us attract some private investment into that. Okay? 
Private investment. So the good example is Mumbai Metro. Okay, they started. What happened? Okay. They have the private investors there. Okay. Initial fare was whatever. That was to make it attractive to get the whole thing. They had low fare. Okay. As soon as the metro started or they announced, they said, well, within in a month or so, we are going to raise the fares. Okay. Huge amount of hue and cry about it. A commission has been set up now. And they are going to look into what would be the fair, appropriate fair. Okay. So the infrastructure investments are like a put option in the sense that they face the downside and not much upside. Because think about it, if you invest in the metro and suppose it starts to make a lot of money, what do you think will happen? People will say, that person, that investor is price gouging. It's a monopoly and he's making a lot of money, right? So let us impose some control and lower the fares, right? So the upside gets clipped. Then suppose that metro or that infrastructure project is losing money. Will people come running and say that, oh, you are losing money as an investor, raise the prices? No, it doesn't happen. It will happen with some delay. It will take some time. So as a result, you will have difficulty getting a whole lot of private investment into those infrastructure. So the government has to step in. And the government in India, they should try invest fair bit in some infrastructure. But the resources are limited. So what they should do is free up resources from places where they shouldn't be and focus on places where they should be. The analogy I give is the role government oftentimes is like middle-aged man's hair. It's missing from where it is needed and it, is, it grows in where it is not needed. Okay? So, so, and that's what is, has to be reversed in some ways. So. So I'm uh, at the Sloan School of Management, and there's a lot of entrepreneurship going on here. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a project. I want to make, uh, you know, technology infrastructure to make uh, digital education like Khan Academy, edX, those kinds of things accessible on mobile phones. Uh, and they want the mobile phones. So I think India is a perfect market for that. Uh, I have an OCI. I have connections to India, and I'd like to set this up in India. However, I think there's some problems in terms of uh, lack of support for bringing people like the Indian diaspora back to India to set up companies, especially technological infrastructure. If you look at, say, my other options out there, um, you know, you have Startup Chile, run by the Chilean government. That's very attractive for me. That, I mean, uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs, they have had a lot of success getting people to Chile, even people who had no connection with Chile. Singapore is another great example. I think what's lacking is uh, either the institutional support to get diaspora back um, to India, maybe through connections between MIT and IIT, uh, to get you know talented Indians back to India to start companies, or to the Indian government itself. For example, if there was a startup India, you know I would be the first to sign up because if, if I could get help setting up a company in an accelerator, I think that would be uh, could be an important channel for growth as well. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's you you have to sort of fire on all cylinders as they say, right? And and that that aspect is definitely the case. Many of those things, okay would be solved if regulation is far less, if it is made it easier for you to hire, how many licenses you might need, or interstate businesses, uh, or getting real estate ownership or rental. So making it easier to do business would go a long way. And on top of that, then the government might be able to focus on issues like that Startup India or there would be other association that will come up and do the trick. And people will, in general, find it attractive to go and settle there if there are a lot of these things are made easier. The good example is that until recently, whether it is MBAs or IITs, they couldn't give the regular degree because University Grants Commission. Now, they had. 50 years and they didn't pay attention to the fact that the whole world thinks the quality is high. There are so many market indicators, but they were sticking to whatever their set of rules as opposed to 
being recognizing what the substance is. So that kind of flexibility, that willingness to embrace merit, willingness to make it easier for businesses to flourish, that requires a somewhat different mindset and it has to come from the top. Um, thank you. Um, some of the ideas I really appreciate and one of them that I am trying to understand better is distributing um, India into 100 states and decentralization sure. of power. Uh, what India has seen till now is that whenever states have been divided or new states have been created, they have not been very uh, politically stable. They have been politically volatile example, case in point, Jharkhand. Um, and they, they have not seen the economic growth that they were so meant to see. Also, the, the challenge of creating 100 states would be that the population size of those states would be smaller. Uh, and there can be chances that socially um, fringe elements can, can come to power, some, something that pro probably what's happening in Uttar Pradesh at the large scale can happen uh, at much, much smaller scales in uh, smaller states. So how do you reconcile the two? A, none of these solutions is perfect, okay? So in the sense that there always would be pros and cons. Okay? Now, if, if the belief is that 200 million people, Uttar Pradesh, that is the right size, then a lot of the people in the world must be getting it wrong, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm just using some amount of what we see in many other parts that are well developed, giving people some power, in India, the always the argument is they would misuse it. Part of the reason they would misuse it is because there is no enforce, law enforcement. So none of these things is going to work piecemeal. If you combine law enforcement with more states, then you might say, gee, you know, yeah, I know someone might try to misuse it, but then if I impose law enforcement on that, then that misuse would be far less. Because now they are saying that, well, I will get caught. So it's not like that person will become sane, but would be deterred from misusing it because they might fear the force of law. So that's the sense in which it's, it's a lot like okay, an operation. Okay. You can't say that, well, I have more anesthesia, though I can do less with a surgeon or with some instruments. No, you can't do that. Things have to be in some proportion. So that's the sense in which here, it is, in some ways, it's a mosaic. It's, it's all the pieces have to hang together. And, and in that sense, you don't want to just do only one thing a whole lot. So I don't want you to think about 100 states in isolation, but in conjunction with many other pieces. Yes, sir. You mentioned this $200 billion figure. Uh, I just wanted to know what the numbers were for the cases of Japan, Korea, and, and other countries that you mentioned. Because 200 billion right now is 13% of Indian GDP. Is that 200 no. billion dollar every year? I mean, not by yeah. purchasing power parity. Yeah. Uh, could you t talk about some success story where that sure. number happened? And yes, yes. In fact, that's why I said, you know, for Mexico, for example, that Mexico, the 200 billion on a per capita basis. Mexico's population is 109 million or so, I think, somewhere in that range. So it's little less than one-tenth. So you would say $20 billion, right? They have been getting more than that. So that is one example. But that same thing, now, China is not quite, it's 200 kind of range, but it's almost there. So China, in the recent years, China has had in excess of $100 billion per year. So that's the sense in which Growth has taken place. Korea, Japan, they received fair bid. Japan was pretty good. And moreover, you know, many of these countries, their challenges were not as severe as India's. China's were. But like Japan was an economic powerhouse before World War II, then World War II, then the, you know, that. And then when they bounced back, but a lot of investment did come from abroad. So, uh, Korea, when it started, even back then, their literacy rates were fairly high. They were not as bad as they are right now in India. So, so in that sense, different countries have been at different stages. But Mexico right now, their literacy rate is 91%, by the way. 
So, you know, I mean, we somehow people don't think of Mexico, the image maybe of India, oh, doctors, lawyers or something. But in reality, you know, Mexico does quite well. So, yes. Um, what do you see as the role of agriculture in this whole growth? Excellent point. Excellent point. Of course, we want agriculture. Right now, agriculture has about 600 million people. The U.S. has 10 million people. 10 million people produce more agriculture than 600 million people. So that is one statistic to remember. Okay. Second, think about it. 600 million people and the total population is 1.3 billion. So let us say it is 1.2, just for you know, half. That means one farmer or one person engaged in agriculture is supporting one other person or, or selling output to one other person you can't be very well off doing that. Only way an, a farmer would do well is if the output, he or she, the output is sold for one person in farming to 10, 20, 30 people outside. Then you would make a good living, right? So what does that mean? What that means is the number of people engaged in agriculture or farming sector will have to shrink dramatically with opportunities being provided in the service and manufacturing industry. Something that happened in China. You know, still the numbers are not quite the US type of numbers in China, but they have had 100, 200 million people migrate from rural areas to urban centers. There is no other alternative. That's what will have to happen Many more urban centers will have to come up in India, but ultimately, it's simply not sustainable that half the population is engaged in agriculture. So now once that agriculture becomes with fewer people, now it's not going to happen overnight. This is, these are all things that will take decades, okay? But the real thing is you, you have to provide some opportunities so that it can be a little more mechanized. It can be larger farming lots are allowed. That's when some of the scale economies will come in. Otherwise, it's incredibly inefficient as it is currently. So, so again, it's, it's also a difficult issue. These are, these are challenges. It's all of these solutions, they are challenging because you have to manage transition. They're good from the starting point to the end point. It's the in-between which is the main action, and that's what makes it much more challenging. How are we on time? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, okay? You, you choose, who's here, you know, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, so, coming back to your original slide on the population growth, I assume that India's been experimenting with policy for the population growth. Yes, yes. Policies that have worked are like Kerala, education is much higher. And Kerala received a huge amount of foreign investment because so many of Keralaites went and worked in Middle East and they started remitting money. So it received foreign investment enormously. So the combination of those two things, much better education and economic well-being. Now that experiment cannot be, we will say, well, why not use the same model elsewhere? Well, it's not possible to make billion people economically well off overnight. So that's where some intervention of making them at least some financial supplement to make them somewhat better off, but tie that financial supplement to education and family planning. So that, again, no coercion, but provide the incentive. So that's the idea that is being built. One last question. One last question. Right? Yeah. Obviously, yeah, so. people want to come up and afterwards and ask. I know people have a class. So that's also the issue. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question around your uh, around the law enforcement. Sure. And uh, so you, I mean, you quoted the number saying the Delhi High Court has a backlog of homes, and I've heard lots of really you know, incredibly large numbers like these. And I'm trying to get a sense of how many of the, I mean, like how intractable the problem is. Is it just a question of throwing more judges at it? 
Or is it a question of, you know, if we really did simplify our legislation, a lot of those cases would just automatically <coughs> go away? And that was one. And the related question is, how do we resolve the question of property rights in India? Even assuming a lot of foreign ownership, etc., the current property boundaries are so disputed and so muddled. Are there other countries that have uh, found some fair or equitable way of resolving property disputes in a quick and efficient manner? Yeah. I think the first problem is a bigger one, okay, in the sense that, and there you are absolutely right, that part of the problem is, are there enough judges? Part of the problem is how, for example, plea bargaining is not allowed in India. Okay, so issues like that. So can we reform those laws and make the processes somewhat more, you know, so amenable to to resolution? Okay. Uh, another is that naturally, if the law enforcement kind of is weak, then squatters' rights type of behavior kicks in. People don't want, people say, yeah, yeah, go to court, okay? Because you know that that's not gonna get resolved. So, and that behavior will change if you know that, yeah, sure, the other side will go to court and get it resolved, then the behavior changes. So the part that, that's where economics is all about how people behave. So if you change the system, many times what happens is people think that the behavior was not going to change. That's where the problem comes because then they think that the policy is not attractive. So I gave the example of foreign currency convertibility, right? The reason that is not attractive is because they think it is static, that nobody will do anything and people will let all the capital to fly. That's not what it is. The moment you say that, okay, I'm going to make that policy, you start thinking about, it's like peeling the onion. You start thinking, okay, if I do that, People will start taking money. So what should I do to prevent them without forcing them to stay inside? So same thing. You have to, we have to think about what would happen. The other part that you are talking about that there are already a lot of disputes. Or I think different people have different perspective on that. I think the dispute might be on 5 or 10% of the land. And so, so in that sense, yes, there would be some issues and is the process going to be fair or not? I always say that we have to ask two questions, okay? One is, is, this, is the solution better than existing? Will it improve? And second, do you have a better alternative, right? You know, if, if there's no point, I'm not trying to say to you, but in general, in the debate, we have to ask, will it improve the circumstances? And if it does, people always, especially in India, they say, oh, but it's not a perfect solution. I understand, but do you have a perfect solution? No, then why, why you? Okay, why worry about the hypothetical perfect solution? So here is a better solution. If you don't have something better than that, let us embrace it. And that's, that's what I try to suggest, so. Thank you very, very much, Thank you.